We are a charity here at the Tank Museum, so if you can support us, please do. Consider joining our Patreon scheme or becoming a member of the Friends. Any donations will go directly towards the Tank Museum and its activities. This tank chat is going to be about the British Army's Challenger 2 tank. And we have the great advantage with Challenger 2, it's an in-service vehicle. We've already talked about the Challenger 1 tank in an earlier tank chat, and I'd recommend have a look at that because that gives the background uh, to why MBT-80 was cancelled and some of the issues that go around that do affect what's going to become Challenger 2. Now, looking at Challenger 2, again, as with Challenger 1, it can seem a fairly complex story, so bear with me again. There's a number of different streams of activities that we need to look at, um, some of which were going on at the same time, so they sort of overlap and everything. So I'll try and take you through those, but the key one to start with is what is the threat? Why are Challenger 2 tanks being built? Um, now this again, so let's go back, we're looking at the Cold War, we're looking at the NATO countries, the Western Allies, uh, the threat of, as they believe it at the time, an invasion from the Soviet bloc, the Warsaw Pact countries coming from the East. Now at the 1960s, 70s, 80s, We've been tracking Soviet tank development all the time in NATO. And one of the issues that, despite the fact that the frontline soldiers often think their kit's best, that it's better than any enemies that's uh, gonna fight against them, in the background, the intelligence services of the military, and certainly in Britain, uh, we had a worry that the Soviet vehicles coming into service, and the Soviets are putting a new tank into service, it works out on average about every seven years, some of these vehicles are catching up with, or if not overtaking, those vehicles that are in service in the West. And we like to have a think in the NATO countries that we always had a technological superiority there. Now, this was vitally important for the British forces because what you're looking at is where the British two armoured divisions were going to fight in what was then West Germany, if the Soviets had attacked, they estimated there would be about 2,000 Soviet tanks uh, fighting against the, British, the two British divisions. And if those British tanks survived what was bound to be a massive Soviet artillery barrage before the attack began, it was estimated in some sectors the British tanks, like the Chieftain, were going to have to take on what might have been 5 to 1 or even 10 to 1 odds against the Soviets. And again, in terms of the technology, worryingly for Britain, uh, when the T-64 tank went into service in 1976, what ends up happening is that they do an estimate that in 1978 they reckon that a chieftain can knock out a T-64 tank at about 2,500 metres. It can pierce the frontal armour of that Soviet tank. However, they then worked out that the Soviet T-64, with its new 125mm gun, could penetrate the front armour of the Chieftain tank at about 2,700 metres. So that's what, in the military terms, they say overmatch. In other words, that tank has a certain superiority there in that particular um, area of firepower. Now, as we all know, and we've said it here before, it's not just top trumps with tanks, it's not just technological features, it can be the training, it can be the deployment, it can be the tactics news, and again, in the West, in NATO countries, we like to comfort ourselves that we were going to be going into pre-prepared positions, uh, we had killing zones where we thought we'd be taking on the Soviet attack, etc., etc. So it's not just an equal balance uh, in just doing it in stats and figures. But that nature of the Soviet threat was starting to worry, or certainly worried the West. And not only were we looking at the tanks that were in service uh, in NATO countries, they called it FSR, um, Future Soviet uh, Requirement, or Future Soviet Tank, FST. They're looking at this idea, what's coming next? So it could be FSR1, FSR2, um, these ones that are coming down the pipeline. So when we're thinking about our own tanks, not only do we need lethality or a firepower that can take on that tank and protection that can protect our own tanks for the current in-service generation that you might be fighting, you've got to look ahead to the future. 
And that nicely segues on to MBT 80. We've talked about MBT 80. It was a program in Britain, 77 to about 1980 when it was cancelled, where we were looking at what would be the ideal way of countering that Soviet threat with a main battle tank. And technologies were researched at the time when the project was cancelled because it was going on a long time. Uh, MBT 80, at one point they were saying MBT meetings before tanks. You know, it was jokingly sort of said this idea it might go on forever. There was technology that weren't mature and the need to get a tank into service to bolster the chieftain fleet led to that uh, cancellation of the MBT 80 project and Challenger 1 going into service. But as I mentioned in the earlier Challenger 1 uh, tank chat, some of those technologies that were being looked at for MBT-80 were very advanced and very clever. So they'd done things like they'd been looking at things like mobility, you know, was a gas turbine an option? Uh, and they put a gas turbine against a CV-12 diesel engine. Um, the key area, though, is relating to what we just talked about, about the Soviet threat, was about firepower and gunnery. Because as we know, really, uh, with Challenger 1, um, when that went into service, it had pretty much the same firepower levels as the earlier Chieftain. And we knew, we were already thinking, Chieftain's not going to be good enough for some of these Soviet tanks coming into service. So what are we doing next? And one of the key things, again for Britain, thinking where it might be fighting on the North German plane with that plethora of targets coming at it, is let's look at the gunnery and the sighting systems because that's going to be most important for us. And for MBT-80, they explored what we now know as the hunter-killer system. Not particularly new, um, because you had the idea of the commander as a hunter, actually even on Conqueror and Chieftain when he's got his uh, separate cupola, he can be looking out for other targets. That was already a, an earlier concept. But with the development of MBT-80, what they looked at was the idea, instead of slaving the site to the main armament, why not slave the main armament to the site? So what does that mean? So instead of having, as you normally have in a tank turret, the site going parallel down the side, uh, coaxially to the main armament, so as you turn the gun around, you're sighting it, why not do it the other way around, where actually you can sight on target, then the gun goes to where the target is. The advantage of that, of course, is that the gunner can be doing his business whilst the commander is picking up targets. And what they came up with was an idea that the commander as the hunter has his own sight and what he actually does is he looks at the terrain, he sights on an enemy, he dots, as it were, on the computer that sight, the gun then turns to that uh, fires, the computer's already working out the distance, etc., that that entails. So the commander's moving on and he can actually dot a number of targets and uh, actually override and prioritise targets, etc. Now, that is obviously a fairly complex system that they were looking at uh, way back at the end of the 70s, early 80s uh, for potentially MBT 80. Now, they actually even included some of the avionics guys that were working on what becomes a tornado jet fighter. Um, for their fire systems, etc., and they're using to develop this some of the very first micro uh, processors. So this was very technologically advanced, but the whole point was it was trying to halve the engagement time from Chieftain. Um, so let's make this much quicker so we can take on targets that much quicker. So remember that one because that's one of those bits of technology that is really useful um, from MBT 80. Now, another issue that's going on as well in the background is Vickers Defence System. Um, we all know the name Vickers. Back in the 30s and late 20s, it's exporting tanks. It's got a history of making export model vehicles. And Vickers, again, after the Second World War, um, they come up with the 37 tonne, it's like a Mark I Vickers export tank, but it's almost like a lighter version of the Centurion. They realise there's always going to be a market out there for people that want to buy a tank but they don't necessarily need the top end product all the time they need a tank but they don't necessarily have to have the cutting technology or the full weight specification of a cold war vehicle so the mark one vickers tank was exported it went to kuwait it went to india uh, they carried on that program they came up with a later model that was sold um, out into africa so uh, kenya nigeria were buying vickers export tanks and in the mid-1980s, after Challenger 1's gone into service, 
using some of the technology that had been developed for the MBT80 program, Vickers come up with what they call the Mark 7 uh, export tank that was available for sale. And that tank used some of this new gunnery uh, in its turret. It looked at as well other types of uh, stealth features almost, like how do you actually stop yourself being uh, targeted by the enemy in the first place. So they start uh, designing the turret so it pings back radar. It's got issues so that you're not, you don't appear so much so easily on the electromagnetic spectrum. So this type of thing was all put into this new turret. And that tank, this export tank, ends up going down to Lulworth, down the road from here, the gunnery ranges, and they do a firing competition with the Mark 7 Vickers export tank against a Challenger 1 tank. And this tank about halves the engagement time and completely creams, completely beats Challenger 1s in terms of the gunnery trial. This was obviously something that the British Army was going to have to take notice of as well. So Vickers are in that export game, but they've also been developing this new tank turret using, having the benefit of using some of the technologies that weren't necessarily ready in time or couldn't be put onto Challenger 1. So there's that element as well to think about there. And of course, Britain has put Challenger 1 into service. Now, Challenger 1, when it goes into service, it only takes up about, it's just over about 400 of about 1,000 tank fleet that was around at the time. The rest of them are still chieftains. And again, when we look at that Challenger 1 story, uh, it goes into service, but it's not a full answer to the problems. The specifications for MBT-80, what the British Army really wanted, has not necessarily been met fully. And there's another element there, which in the background, there's almost this attitude that at some point in the future, future, we are, and they were probably estimating mid to late 90s, we're going to need another tank to go into service, that whether it's going to be bought from abroad or whether it's going to incorporate all these MBT-80 new types of technology, we're going to need something there. So this leads in 1986, uh, what's called the Master General Ordnance, uh, Sir Dick Vincent, he goes off to Vickers Defence System and he sits with them and he has a chat and he says, look, we're going to have to require a new tank in the future. And I'm just going to read you my notes which actually list what that tank was going to be needed to do and the priorities that the British Army were going to put because as we all know, a tank is always a compromise. If you have got great firepower, if you have thick armor, tends to make the tank slower, um, mobility, all those different elements. What is it that Britain considered the primary uh, role of that tank? How's it going to work? So let me just read to you what Dick Vincent is ending up saying um, to Vickers and the priorities that come out of this that sets the Challenger 2 program in essence going with Vickers. So this is what the British Army decides it wants, and it's actually called a, a Staff Target Land, or STL, 4004. This is what they say. They want it to have new firepower to defeat at 2,000 metres the frontal armour of any Soviet tank and helicopters out to 3,000 metres. Again, back then, the new threat seems to be helicopters. How are we going to take those down as well? It's got to improve the survivability over Challenger 1. It's got to have mobility as good as Leopard 2. It's got to have availability. In other words, this thing can't be broken down all the time. Availability as good as Challenger 1, which had increased considerably um, since way back in the days of Chieftain. And uh, it's got to have interoperability, hopefully with the same fuel, same ammunition as other NATO countries. And we'll see that changes slightly. And the British Army says it orders these issues that go with a tank into this order. Firepower is prominent, is, is absolute paramount, I should say. Survivability, second. Mobility, third. Reliability, fourth. Interoperability, fifth. Fightability, next. Simplicity, again, that was another really important thing there, and command and control features last on that list there. So that was how Britain looked at that as one of those issues when it's going to Vickers. So what happens? Vickers goes away. It's often, if you read the different accounts of Challenger 2, it says it's a private venture. Not really, because they know that the army is setting out this requirement. They know that behind the scenes that there is a requirement for a tank that is going to meet the army's uh, needs other than Challenger 1. And as we said, that the army really wants about uh, 800 to 1,000 tanks in service. 
Challenger 1 is only making up about 400 of those tanks, just slightly over that. Um, so there, there is a, a, a need out there. It's not just a pure private venture on behalf of Vickers. They come back the following year to MOD with a couple of options, one of which is a slightly souped up Challenger 1. Another one is an option that gives the MOD basically an improved Challenger 1 hull but the real key, it's almost got that turret off the Mark 7 export tank. Um, it's gonna cost you about 65,000 pounds more, but it's got that superior firepower that there, it was at the top of the list from the MOD. Um, MOD goes away, it looks at other industries. It sort of says, uh, it goes to Chertsey again, and says, what might you come up with? Um, they come up with something called PIP, Pro Product Improved um, Tank. So, there's a number of options that go on at the same time. It is not a done deal with Vickers, but Vickers ends up getting a contract to develop the Challenger 2 idea, where lots of other things are being um, looked at at the same time, and we'll talk about some of those in a second. Um, so this idea that um, it's about 10% changes, MOD says to Vickers, we need it to do this, not that, etc. as they go away, and Vickers goes away and starts working on this. And two key points come out here, one of which is with the Challenger 2, MOD are absolutely determined that with that reliability, this is going to be a tank that is heavily tested before it gets out to the troops. Um, so we know about reliability, all those different issues have really been dealt with. So in the end, they actually talk about Challenger 2 as probably the most tested tank in history. Lots and lots of evaluation goes on, lots of testing. There's also a point as well where it becomes very much a co a uh, cooperative venture between MOD and Vickers because both sides want to get the best thing. And that's always nice to hear um, because from the point of view of actually the end user troop wants the best thing, not just um, what they could have afforded, etc. at the time. But I mentioned the word afforded because there's another key element there, cost. And this is one of those things that quite often when we talk about technologies, etc., we rarely bring in the idea of cost. Um, the British government are obviously do not want to pay too much money um, for whatever tank is going into service next. Next, so that this idea of a fixed price contract is really important for MOD with Vickers. What can we get for that money? And we can't see it creeping up all over the place, um, but we need it to be a reliable vehicle. And there's some of the items that might have been nice to see on Challenger 2 in the end just don't get there because of cost issues. Uh, and that money also, this affects when at a point in the programme, uh, the British government says to MOD, right, let's lay out the options. Nine different options are being looked at, including Leopard 2. Leopard 2 was assessed heavily. Um, the British Army likes Leopard 2, but it does not think that the levels of protection on the turret are good enough. When they say about, could we put Chobham armor on it? That ended up, we like the idea as well, you know, what about if we change the smoothbore gun, etc., to a rifle gun? Um, what happens there is that they decide that, no, that's gonna to take too long. It's gonna to cost too much money. It'll be another at least a couple of years. We're gonna drop that one. And the Leopard 2 package, they like Abrams as well. That's offered as well. But both the Abrams and the Leopard 2 comes in at over 2.5 billion to pay for a new fleet of tanks and all the ancillaries that go with that. Challenger 2 is being offered at 1.75 billion. So that is one of those other key deciders. And of course, in the background, you've got that issue that uh, Margaret Thatcher at the time and then John Major, they're very keen really to see MOD buy British as well. They want to see that investment going into Vickers as a British company. Vickers end up buying the Royal Ordnance Factory at Leeds. They've got the new factory up in Newcastle. You know, there's a lot, there's a point in 1989 where Vickers are saying, listen, unless we get some orders soon, we're really looking at uh, 1.5 million a month, as it were, just to keep these factories going and open um, with nothing there. So we really need to, if, you, if you're going to use us, otherwise, again, and this is one of those long-term strategic problems governments have, um, do you want your own defence industry? Um, absolutely, if you can't afford to keep one going, etc., or it's too small, uh, it seems logical, buy abroad, but what, when abroad is not available to sell to you, or all of a sudden in times of war, they might want material for their own armed forces and not want to sell to you. So, um, you know, a whole host of other issues coming into play here, politics, as well as budgets there. Now, I mentioned earlier as well, MBT-80, what was going on with some of that research. 
gunnery, we've said about the sighting, but also the Royal Armaments Research and Development Establishment is looking at a new 120 millimeter rifle gun. Now, when they said earlier they wanted interoperability with other nations, why didn't we go for smoothbore? Now, Britain has what some people have almost called an obsession with a Hesh round, and Hesh has to be fired by a rifled gun to get its best effect. So what is it about Hesh? Britain liked Hesh because the primary purpose of a 120 gun is firing uh, an armour-piercing round, and as we know, a fin round, the longer the fin round, uh, the more force behind it, the more armour it's going to go through. So that was the primary round. But secondary, for the role of high explosive and potential bunker busting, knocking out other armour, etc., um, a Hesh round, high explosive squash head, works very, very well as well. Uh, and Britain liked this. The whole idea of a Hesh round, a thin outer coating, an inert uh, sort of material on the top of it, the rest of the shell full of high explosive, a detonator at the base. And the idea is, is it doesn't matter about the force behind the round. Uh, when it hits its target, it tends to, if it's armour or building, it will pancake, it will squash against that target before the detonator hits as well and detonates that pancake of high explosive, that sends a shock wave of its armor plate through and a scab comes off on the inside. Now that means you can fire this round at an enormous distance because the force is not the issue. As long as it hits the target, the effect will be the same. And uh, we like that. And in the end, actually, that, that Hesh round, very useful. Um, we were even using practice Hesh rounds that are actually full of concrete in Operation Telic in Iraq um, because they were actually firing um, these practice rounds to do what they call mouse holing. It would end up burrowing its way through things like concrete or adobe walls, giving a hole for the soldiers to follow through um, without collateral damage. So again, very interesting use there of uh, of a training Hesh round. So Britain still like that idea of Hesh. So again, that gun married up with that Mark 7 turret is going to give Challenger that fighting edge. Now, in May of 1994, Challenger 2, after various different types of trials, is accepted into service. Those trials continue. As I mentioned, it's tested, it's trialed all the time. Um, by the summer of uh, 1994, it's driven about 22,000 kilometers. Um, there's nine prototypes. Uh, so Robert Heyman Joyce, who's put in charge of the project at one point, he gets some extra money out of the treasury. Let's build nine prototypes so we can really trial all the different features of Challenger, um, really to get the best from it. Uh, reliability improvement programs, they're called as they're going on. What can we make this better? How can we make it more efficient? Um, they end up with those nine prototypes. Two are made in Newcastle, the rest of them made down at the Leeds factory. And this one standing next to me is actually V5. They're V1 to V9, um, V for Vickers, we're not sure vehicle. Um, and this one, V5, was mainly used for automotive trials. So it was driven around the place. So 22,000 kilometers driven by those Challenger uh, prototype vehicles. 12,000 rounds fired by the main armament. You know, this is really a heavily tested tank before it's accepted. It goes into production. Those first vehicles that come out have problems, um, and that's another little lesson to learn. So the uh, prototype vehicles compared to the production vehicles aren't always the same. So that led the army to do, introduce sort of field trials teams and integration teams so that it worked out that I think it's about four in every 38 Challenger 2s that came off the production line ended up being taken to one side and examined heavily. And it was also helped as well that the field army could help integrate when they're actually being issued so that they could be warned of or look at some of those issues. So there's those problems, any other problems when you've got a big complex system, they're bound to be there, um, can be ironed out quickly and that is fed back to the production run. Now, this all takes place over from the later 1980s, Cold War still going on. Uh, obviously, the Berlin Wall comes down in 1990. There was an initial estimate, 800 plus Challenger 2s might be needed. As soon as the ball at Berlin Wall comes down, it comes down to about 360 plus um, Challenger 2s uh, are actually put on order. And in 1990, with the Gulf War, another thing that comes into play as well is that all production, all all development is stopped at that particular time, so concentrations can go on to the Challenger 1 fleet 
going out to fight uh, in the Gulf War. So that, that was another one of those areas where, again, actually in the background, Vickers kept on the development and the test program at their own expense because they're very keen to make sure this is a good product there. So it's given out to the field army. Um, it's a tank that, as I say, has had tremendous amounts of research going on behind it. Um, it's got, it takes with it the hull in essence, um, slightly improved from the Challenger 1. It's got an improved level of Dorchester armour on it that's going to be put on that. It's got this fantastic hunter killer system in terms of the gunnery. It's got a CV-12 uh, diesel engine in the back of it um, and it is quite an impressive package. And again, when it's issued to the troops, there is this sort of sense of when they're looking at it, they're looking at the pros and cons. This is a real step change from Challenger 1 and Chieftain that's been in service. So that's that bit of the development story. Let's just have a look now at some of the features by looking at our Challenger 2 here. So looking at Challenger 2, uh, we can see there are similarities in how it looks like Challenger 1. The big difference, of course, if you're just trying to do from the point of view of recognition, how do you tell Challenger 1 from Challenger 2? Look at that, what they call a barbette that's above the main gun. Uh, that contains togs underneath a housing there. That's in the middle on Challenger 2, above the gun. On Challenger 1, it's on the side of the turret. Um, so looking at the different features, we've mentioned already the firepower. This is the L30 charm gun, 120 millimeter. Um, it's rifled still. It's got the muzzle reference distance on the end of the barrel. The sight there above for the uh, thermal observation. This one, because it's V5, we don't actually have the commander's round uh, sight that's normally just in front of his position is not fixed to V5. Um, but the idea there, that is what the commander is looking through and it's got a 360 vision, can go all the way around and the gunner sight is actually in front of it on the turret top and there's a revisionary, an old telescopic sight um, that actually is on the side of the gun so that if all the other systems fail they can still look through and it's got the old graticules and crosshairs on and still aim the gun if the other systems break down at all. It's got a laser range finding system on it that is accurate plus or minus five metres out to 9,950 metres and again uh, back to looking at generation as a tank, this idea that you can accurately estimate your target, really important, so that again if you're firing hairship, it's going over the top, you know exactly where it's going to land. If you're firing directly, it's in range because again, uh, flat trajectory um, of, a, of a fin round that's going off there direct towards the target. These are all elements that come into play. And on the back of the turret, in one of the bustles, there's actually a weather reading station that again feeds information into the main computer. So if you're going to be firing and there's a crosswind at etc. All of those atmospherics are taken into account before the main armament is actually fired. Um, so again we've mentioned the fact this gun they're lasting longer in service because now with this gun they're actually chroming the barrels. Um, one of the things we don't often talk about is obviously when a round actually goes down that rifle barrel it actually is tremendously abrasive as it's going down the barrel so it actually wears away very very quickly. By chroming the barrel you're extending barrel life um, so it'll go on a lot longer and again these things all actually come into play when we talked earlier about cost because you don't want to be replacing a very very expensive barrel too often um, same as why they've got simulators now actually let's we do need to fire real rounds that's the only way the soldiers are going to be able to find out but if they can learn a lot of that on simulators and training aids etc it brings the overall cost of running a tank down um, but very effective gunnery system there um, Inside the turret to actually man that, uh, you've got the traditional three guys in the turret, fourth guy down the front as a driver. So commander, hunter, looking out for the targets, using that sighting system. The gunner sits in front of him. He's got almost what looked like a PlayStation controls for controlling the actual gun uh, and firing. On the opposite side, again, is the loader. The loader has, again, go back to looking like a Challenger 1 and even before that, Chieftain. Uh, rounds are stowed around him. It's what we would now call three-part ammunition. You've got the round would go in, followed by a bag charge that are in protected um, uh, bins that, the, uh, that they go around the bottom of the turret. Um, and they are, they're all kept, by the way, any explosive kept below the turret line. So again, extra protection there. Um, the bag charge goes in 
and then there's a, a small cartridge that is actually used to actually fire that out the end of the barrel uh, with a tremendous force as you can imagine that goes on in there. So three of them, the driver's down at the front, He's the guy that, again, from the point of view, he's got a reclining position. Um, that, so, that again, that, that keeps the turret nice and low when he's driving along or he can make his seat sit up so he can look straight forward. He's got a night side if he wants to be driving at night as well that he can change uh, on his vision port there. The one of the areas that was criticised and in the up, future upgrade is bound to change. Um, the commander does not have um, a night sight so that he can't engage in the same way as a gunner can in that hunter-killer manner. And that's one of the future improvements that, that, again, that was a cost issue early days, picked up very early on. That was one of the disappointments from what otherwise is a, is a very superb and accurate gunnery system. 12 seconds, by the way, to turn that entire turret around. And it's, uh, if you watch it on exercise, etc., it's very, very impressive how quickly it can lock onto a target um, and how quickly the crew there can engage because this was one of the aims. It had to be about twice as fast. Um, they wanted it all to be than Challenger 1 and Chieftain before it. Drivers I mentioned in there, it's a tiller system he's using and uh, to power the vehicle along at the back is a CV12 Rolls-Royce turbocharged diesel engine. Um, now that can get the vehicle up on road speeds, officially about 60 kilometers. They can go way faster than that actually, probably about to 80 on roads. Challenger 2 has eight fuel tanks, which all together take about 1,500 liters carried under the armor. Uh, but of course, if you look around the back, there's those two extra fuel drums, um, 350 litre fuel drums. That means it gives about an extra 100 kilometres if you put those on as well on range. So a, a Challenger 2 can go with its normal fuel tanks, 450 kilometres, or an extra 100, 550 if it's carrying those two extra uh, fuel drums on the rear. Um, in terms of uh, weight, the overall vehicle here, um, again, it's down just over 60 tonnes. When they add all the extra armour on, so what we would call theatre entry standard, so they will put the side armour on, the extra armour on the front, the bridging weight then goes up. They actually uh, classify it as an 80 tonne bridging weight on, on this particular vehicle. Um, so it becomes a much different vehicle. So really what you're looking at normally is when it trains, it doesn't have the extra armour on. The extra armour, depending on the nature of the conflict it goes to, they add the extra Dorchester armour around the sides, front packs as well, or era armour, explosive reactive armour goes on the front. So that all that gets added on. And because of Operation Telic and uh, the idea of urban warfare, bar armour can be added as well. So um, depending on the nature of the conflict you're going to, you will build up that levels of protection. Now RV5 here, it has not got the bazooka plates on the side. In fact, those bazooka plates are really there just to take the signature down a bit and hold the dust down. Um, actually, again, it would be standard practice to add Dorchester level two armour packs on the side as soon as you were going to go off to conflict. So you wouldn't normally see it. And this one hasn't got any, any plates on at all. Now, as part of that transmission, the engine pack in the back is bolted to a TN54 transmission. Um, that's all comes out. You can change the engine in about an hour, hour and a half, um, which again is tremendously different from the eight hours previously for um, vehicles like Chieftain or about, you know, about an hour, we think, on Leopard 2 to do an engine change. And that engine is giving that power to uh, about 1,200 upgrading slightly in the future to the drive sprocket, which in British vehicles, again, is at the rear there. And that's driving this track along. And what you're looking here, um, this is double pin track. It's got rubber pads on. The rubber pads are only really to protect roads. Um, there's no issue about, they don't add anything to the combat efficiency. It just stops um, tanks ripping up the roads. Uh, so certainly, and it's a legal requirement in most Western European countries. Double pin going through, and this is what they call a live track. Um, the actual bushes in there are actually sprung, and that's what means that the track, if you lay it down, it's got a natural curve inwards. It wants to curve up because of that springing system in there. So hence the phrase live track that they've got there. Uh, road wheels, you've got double road wheels, 12 on each side. And again, during the production run, just like the track, actually three different types of track have been used on Challenger as improvements come into service. 
These are the early road wheels. Uh, later on, they ended up with road wheels with little holes in, 15 holes, reduced the weight a little bit, but that wasn't the issue. It was to stop mud compacting between the double wheels. Uh, and again, these road wheels are on hydrograss suspension arms. Have a look at our recent workshop diaries um, where Jonathan takes you through how hydrograss works, basically nitrogen gas and an oil. Um, and it acts both as a damper and a spring as well as you're going along. So it's a shock absorber and it springs back all with that one arm. And it's a, a really sophisticated system by Horseman Defence. And it gives a tremendously smooth ride, which again, by having a smooth ride, it means that gun, when you're firing on the move, has got a much more ch accurate chance of hitting the target um, because you've got such a stable platform underneath you as you're moving along. And when you're looking at the outside of a Challenger 2 tank, um, you're really looking at a skin. The key armour protection is underneath. So for example, with the turret, it's got a cast front, a welded back to it, but then the Chobham armour packs are put on there and this thin metal skin is welded over the top. So it's underneath is a key element of, again, with Challenger tanks, that uh, very interesting matrix that makes up uh, Chobham armour, which has tremendously good defensive capabilities, not just against uh, uh, kinetic energy rounds, but uh, chemical rounds as well. So really important feature there. And as I mentioned earlier, or will mention, um, a very important thing that gives confidence to the crews because the survivability of a Challenger is outstanding. Um, again, looking at some of those other features that we can see from the outside, smoke dischargers banked either side, but Challenger also, like a number of tanks, has the, the way of making smoke by being able to put diesel onto the hot exhaust, and that builds up a big white smoke stream very quickly, so you can hide yourself, back off um, your reposition, etc., without the enemy being able to visually see you. And again, you'll see that faceted surface, which I talked about earlier on, part of that is to do with this idea of, of lessening your signature to radar. Um, and again, a lot of things that you might have seen on the outside of the tank in the older days are actually now hidden in those boxes at the rear, the bustle at the back of the turret. They're actually, uh, there's a number of different boxes there. So other equipment is hidden in there rather than being on the outside, which actually changes the signature of the vehicle. And again, in the back of that bustle, you've got an MBC, an overpressure system. And also for the crews, one of the great advantages with Challenger 2, you've also got a crew temperature system so that you can actually adjust the temperature inside the vehicle, which of course, if you're out in batters on the Canadian prairies in cold weather, fantastic that you've got a heating system. Or the other extreme is if it's getting very hot in there, um, it's in essence a type of air conditioning there as well. So that's again, a really important feature for, the, uh, for crews comfort and the ergonomics. And again, you're looking at a generation where what you might call the earlier tanks, um, the ergonomics have been thought through an awful lot better so that all the guts of the tanks, the wiring, there was half a tonne of wiring on the, I think it was Chieftain alone, you know, all of that that was exposed inside the turret, much of that's now gone uh, in, the, in the way it's been put together. Uh, fire suppression system for the engine that you've got there as well, um, as that you'll see on a lot of modern vehicles now. Um, and again, overall, one of the things that comes across, as I mentioned that word ergonomics, the crews liked Challenger 2 an awful lot. It's not just it's got that better firepower, there's a lot more comfort elements to do with Challenger truck crew. This has got a, um, a, a hydraulic tensioner system. The driver can tension the track inside. That again means wear rates of the track don't go, um, go through the roof. If you've got slack track, it's wearing it quicker. So things like that are thought through um, and really do benefit the crew compared to that previous generation there. Um, so overall, a very impressive bit of kit and uh, something, as I mentioned as well, it's going to be in service quite some time. So those upgrades, just like they've been going on all the time, really, as this tank's gone into service, smaller upgrades have been going on throughout its service life. Uh, and that's why when you look at some of the imagery, you'll see very different, not just the protection standards, but sometimes different items, like I mentioned, the road wheels. That's part and parcel of just a tank being in service as newer items come into play or a better model of something is there to be used. Now Challenger 2 has seen operational service. It went off to the Balkans where again, fortunately it didn't have to fire its gun in anger, but as we've talked about before, quite often with peace enforcement, um, just turning up with a tank tends to make people back off, understand the issues. Um, some of the factions in the Balkans were actually invited to see Challenger 2 firing just from that point of view of saying, listen, this is a sort of uh, 
threat we have here if we have to use it. So it's been there, it's seen service in, uh, in Europe. Uh, it's seen service, of course, in Operation Telic 2003, the invasion of Iraq from Kuwait, and the British forces there ended up going out with uh, a battle group, 7th Armoured Brigade, ends up there going out and using the Challenger 2. There are engagements with enemy tanks. Uh, it is very successfully used. And one of the things that come out when you look at Operation Telic is the survivability of the tanks. So going back to that design process, Dorchester Level 2 armour, the extra armour that was put on the size, has a tremendous confidence giving boost to the crews because one of those Challenger 2s was actually struck by 30 or over 30 RPGs, um, none of them penetrated. There was only one penetration of a Challenger 2 where the driver got slightly wounded in his foot. Um, there was a loss of a Challenger 2, but that was a blue on blue incident. So actually, um, you know, there's always going to be something that's going to defeat a tank at some point. But in Operation Telic, that Dorchester Level 2 armour, the upgrades, etc., really proved their worth. We're here on Salisbury Plain at a training area called Cope Hill Down, and we're with the crew of 3-4 Bravo. That's a Challenger 2 of the Royal Tank Regiment, and the crew are going to tell us what their role is and how they'd operate a vehicle such as this. Sergeant James Teese, you're the commander of this vehicle. Can you just tell us a little bit, first of all, about what your role is as a commander of a Challenger 2? My role as a, a Challenger 2 commander is but I have overall control of the vehicle uh, and all other three, because there's four of us complete inside the vehicle, ensuring that the gunner is laid onto the correct targets, my driver's going in the right direction and not going over any dangerous ground, and my operator is loading the main armament, or more importantly, making brews for the crew as well at the same time. But that's your role? That's not, your role. not my role, I'll delegate that one off. The normal makeup of our troop would be, we'd have our troop leader, which is from a second lieutenant up to roughly sometimes a captain, maybe. Uh, we have our troop sergeant, which is myself. Uh, we have our, our senior corporal, uh, which is a more experienced of the two corporal tank commanders. And we have a junior corporal, which is normally joined us just off the bat of his commander's course. And then as you rotate through your troop and experience, you then go up the, the call signs from there on. I don't think there's ever a, a time limit to becoming an effective tank commander. I think every time you do an exercise, there's always something new to learn as a commander and obviously learn off other people. But I think to be a, a very competent tank commander it takes you about three to maybe four years to really get a grip of everything you need to do. As it goes for the, like being really good, uh, it just, it never really ends. You can always- and Are you really good? That. Oh, no comment. <laughs> and Challenger 2 as a tank, how do you like it? You know, what's the pros and cons of working on Challenger 2? I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good vehicle. Uh, I think any vehicle that's brought into service have their issues. Uh, we all have to work around it. As a, as a running vehicle, as long as they're kept all the time running, uh, they're, they're like quite good, reliable vehicles at times. We have a massive impact on the battlefield, not only not only just as a fear factor for the enemy, you know, we've seen one of these come around the corner as a dismount is quite, you know, quite terrifying, um, but also just holding the ground and working with our infantry, uh, of our infantry call signs, it's just a good mixture. Trooper Lewis Harrington, you are the driver of this Challenger 2. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to drive a Challenger 2? It is pretty intense driving it off-road. It is, it is really fun because uh, it, it can get up to some really high speeds whilst going over some really rough terrain. Um, whilst the gun is also inside trying to keep, keep the gun level and, uh, and scanning for targets and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's really enjoyable. My, my vision is basically when I'm, when I'm hatched down is just through that small uh, sight just there. You do have a permanent view of the front of the vehicle so you you can scan look for enemy and that sort of thing whereas everyone else is looking through a site which is obviously always on the move. The best way to tell if you're, if you're doing all right is the less input your commander has so if your commander's talking to you all the time obviously he's having to bring you on but if your commander's sort of allowing you to do it and he knows you're competent and you can get into a fire position without him having to tell you where to go you can he can point off a wood lock, wood block in the uh, in the distance and you can find the best route tactically to get there so once you get to that sort of point then you know you you're doing all right and what's it like driving at night so we have night sights that we can put in which are good to an extent you can see quite a bit it, it's a lot more difficult you can't really tell texture on the ground so it's hard to read ground as you're driving so um, everything looks flat so if you're going off cross country everything just looks pan flat and flat in front of you and um, 
that's when you sort of start to have to rely on the other crew members and especially the gunner because he's got quite a good view. If, if he's scanning out to the front, he can be calling bump ahead, come right stick and that sort of thing. So you, it, like I say, at night it is, it's difficult, but it's easily workable. And yeah. what do you drive in normal civilian life? I have a uh, Volkswagen Scirocco. Okay, and yeah. do you find that jumping between the two ever a bit, a bit of a yeah. challenge? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in this, you've got to be quite aggressive with everything. So you, right. you brake, you really have to put a lot of force on your brake. So as soon as you jump in your, yeah. your civilian car, you jab the brakes on, you kind of woof, fly forward a bit and you're not in the tank. <laughs> so schoolboy stuff, is it a bit of a thrill driving one of these? Yeah, 100%. Well, that's the main reason I joined the regiment, is, is to drive the Challenger 2. It's a big, massive lump of metal with a V12 engine in it. It's got a lot of power and it is, it is for, for someone who's a bit of a petrol head and likes driving, yeah, it's fantastic. So you're Trooper Carl Davis and you're the gunner on this Challenger 2? I am, yeah. Could you just tell us a little bit about what that role is as being a gunner? So my role on the vehicle is I'm in control of the 120mm cannon, the Kikesley mounted machine gun. And along with the rest of the crew, my job is to mainly find, identify and eliminate the targets. If we identify a vehicle, I'll then report that up. The commander will give me the authority to fire to that vehicle. I'll go through the systems to get the vehicle on, on target and then fire and eliminate the vehicle. So we have a, a HESH round, which is our high explosive round, which you'd use for more armoured personnel carriers or softer skin vehicles. We have a FIN round, which is a, in essence, a dart an armour piercing round, which you'd use for anti-tanks, stuff like that. And then we have smoke for the vehicle, and we have the Kikes mounted machine gun, which is 7.62. And when you go on an exercise, you get to fire most of those rounds? Yeah, we get to fire all the ammunition. When you fire it for the first time, it's, it's genuinely an experience. It's, it's pretty surreal when you fire it and you feel the kick of the gun, and actually sit in the vehicle and do it for the first time. And what's it feel like seeing the effect of some of those rounds on a target? I think when you do it down range the first time, you realise what, what kind of power you're in control over the vehicle and seeing, it, seeing the ricochet and some of the stuff you can do with it, it's pretty amazing. Lance Corporal David King, you're the operator or the loader on this Challenger 2. Can you just give us a little bit of an indication about what that role, what it entails? Yeah, so on the operator side, I'm up in the turret with the gunner and the commander. Basically, the role of the, of the operator is what should be doing is, I'm on that side, I'll be loading the gun. So making sure that the gunner, well, as soon as he's found the target, he's ready to fire. There's something in the gun ready to go down and kill what's on the other side. We've got uh, the three different types that we can use mostly. We've got the fin, uh, we've got the hash. We've also got a smoke round whether we know we're going to and kind of meet more tanks rather than soft skin takes what ammunition we're going to take. Dealing with more of the, uh, the radio side as well, so if anything the radio goes go down, I've got to make sure they're always up and running because if we lose communications, we've lost communications on the battlefield and that's something we don't want to do. We don't want to be isolated at any point. And the minor thing when we get into highs, I'm usually the mother of the tank. So I make sure everyone's fed, everyone's had their brews, everyone's all nice and warm as well. Okay, so sort of the father figure or the mother figure. Yeah, you you've got the father, it, so. the commander, and you've got the mother on the operator side. Right. Yeah. So I really enjoy it myself because it's that point you can kind of step up and you can show off to everyone that you, you can do it. You've kind of got most of the responsibilities to the commander, but if anything goes wrong, it's not really your fault because it's always the commander's fault. So you can take a step out and go, well, like I say, it's fault, not mine. And then we've also got like a gunnery wing up at a camp where we can actually practice loading the rounds. So it's like a mock inside of the turret. You actually practice loading the rounds. They practice phone in. Uh, so something could go wrong and they've got to see how quickly you can deal with it and you've got to deal with it properly at the same time. With the, the gun we've got to make it's a three piece ammunition, you've got to put the round up, you've got to put the charge up, you've got to make sure both of them go up as quick as possible, make sure the right charge goes with the right round. For example, if you fumble about and you put the wrong round in with the wrong charge, you're not going to hit the target, or if you put the charge in without the round. So it's a lot of pressure that you're on at the minute to make sure you do it properly. You don't want to be that one that obviously muddles up. It depends what tank you're on, how much stick you're going to get afterwards. So if you want to shoot leaders well, then you should be able to do it straight away because you're the senior guy in that troop to be able to do it. But the more junior guys, they do tend to do something wrong and all that, then you've just got to come off and teach them how to do it properly. You can be lucky enough to stay with a crew for quite a while, but then people get promoted, people get moved away, people do tend to leave. So sometimes you do have to change it about. But if you go deployed, so we went to Oman, we kept our crew for the couple of months that we were there. So it's not like on a daily basis you're moving around, but sometimes when you're in camp and you're not doing anything, the crews can change because people can get promoted 
or people could like not want to be anyone to leave. But you do normally want to stick together. The last school we had, we got quite a good bond together. We knew what we had to do and so we, so everyone knows you're like a weld oil machine. My dad was in the 4th Royal Tank Regiment, so he was back in the day and he was just to say that the tankies were the best way and it was always the one you wanted to go to. So it's kind of grown up with them stories and the pictures of him standing in front of the tanks and telling me like he was a commander and it was better in his day and that uh, the army's not where it used to be anymore. So I'm kind of just trying to show him to prove him that I can get out there and be in commander just like him. Yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, I love being a tank commander. I think, I think if you if you join the regiment and you join the Royal Tank Regiment, it, it should be the seat that you want to be in. Uh, otherwise, you, you're in the wrong place, basically. And it, and I say to a lot of the younger lads when we're we're working on a vehicle, or, you know, that have just joined the squadron, you know, there is no better feeling. You know, being up the top, you have your arms out the cupola, cross country, you know, doing 40 kilometres an hour, going into a battle run, closed down. You know, it's a great feeling. It's a great responsibility as well, but it's great. Now, Challenger 2, if you go online at any time, one of the issues that's going on is that obviously in its service life, it's had a continuous number of smaller upgrades, things that go on to keep it in, uh, in better trim or here's a better product or how do we go it. The truth though is, is it's going to have to stay in service. At the moment, the Army's arguing 2035, maybe 2040, it's going to need a much more major upgrade and a number of different projects were being put together to see about whether it's automotive, whether it's gunnery, what that upgrade should be. Now, we're fortunate here at Bovington, we can look at that with you in the future because Bovington is where the trials and development unit is. Um, we can be talking to industry as well and we'll come back to Challenger 2 to in the future so we can show you what that upgrade is going to be and uh, already from what we know about it, it's quite an exciting development for the Challenger 2 tank. Uh, because again, and we'd come back, we would say this here at the Tank Museum, wouldn't we? What's happened in the Challenger 2 lifespan, we've looked at seeing the tank yet again go through the Cold War dividends. Half the Royal Armoured Corps regiments ended up being cut during the 1990s. The Challenger, the main battle tank fleet, came down uh, an awful lot, and it's now probably around 260 tanks odd, um, with some in reserve. So what's gonna happen with the tank in the future? When, of course, as you like following the tank subject, we had a point where it was no, there's no need for the tank again, and yet that pendulum has swung back. Other countries, not just Britain, are reinvesting in tanks. There's options for new tanks, uh, some countries have looked at, some are putting into production. And of course, what a lot of people are doing is instead of rebuilding a brand new tank, or they're rebuilding an older version, hence that phrase platform. They're looking at a tank as a platform. What do we add to it? What might we take off? How do we configure it for the nature of the conflict it might be going into? Um, so that idea about the tank being dead, we've always said that here. Come on, let's be careful about that. Um, but we can help uh, show you what's going to happen with Challenger 2 in the future because this is a tank the British Army is going to be used in some sort of configuration for probably decades to come. If you're interested to know more about Challenger 2, we've helped in this uh, Haynes manual on the Challenger 2. You can get this via uh, our shop, so look at our online website, which sells all sorts of other products as well. And do please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel. And if you have the opportunity, um, also back us by funding us through Patreon. Um, we are an independent charity. We can only carry on doing all this if people like yourself support us. So please do find a way of supporting the Tank Museum.